Are you looking for an SEO strategy that will actually increase your traffic? Well, keep watching because I'm gonna show you my four pillar SEO strategy that works. All right, so let's start with pillar one of my SEO strategy framework. So the first pillar of this SEO strategy is to focus on pleasing your users. So what does it mean to please your users? It means that users slash searchers should have a seamless experience on your website. And just to illustrate how important user experience is for SEO performance, here's a quote from John Mueller, who is the head Webmaster Trends Analyst at Google. John said, I see lots and lots of SEO blogs talking about user experience, which I think is a great thing to focus on as well, because that essentially kind of focuses on what we're trying to look at as well. We want to rank content that is useful for them, Google search users, and if your content is really useful for them, then we want to rank it. So the main takeaway here is that Google values user experience. So how do you go about actually improving user experience on your website? And improving your user experience all starts with technical SEO. And there are two parts to technical SEO that you need to understand. There are high impact technical issues and there are low impact technical issues. But before I jump into all of the technical issues that you can fix to improve user experience, I wanna tell you a quick story to help illustrate the importance of understanding how to do technical SEO. So back in 2016, a supplement company in St. Louis came to my company because they wanted help with their SEO performance. And they were already doing really well from many different perspectives. They were doing well with social media, they were doing well offline, they were doing very, very well, and the company was growing month to month, but they needed to improve their organic search performance. So as soon as we brought them on as a client, the first thing we did was we ran a complete SEO audit. And because they're an e-commerce website, we wanted to make sure that the website was built on a strong foundation before we started building out new content assets and trying to acquire backlinks. So we focused purely on the technical side of their website and the user experience side of their website first. So in this audit, we uncovered all kinds of stuff, including their navigation not being set up correctly and their site architecture not being built well. And then we also found all kinds of issues having to deal with duplicate content, thin content, and several other technical issues that you're gonna be learning about later on in this video. So then after going through the process of finding all these technical issues and user experience issues, and then fixing all of them, we were able to increase this client's organic search traffic by 90%. And this was all achieved just by improving the technical performance and the user experience on their website. So now that you know the power of improving the technical performance of your website, I'm gonna show you the high impact actions you should focus on. So the first action you need to take to improve your website's technical performance and user experience is to increase your website loading speed. So I don't know about you, but a slow loading website is one of the most painful experiences you can have online. And the truth is a slow loading website won't only hurt your organic search performance, but it can actually hurt your business as well. According to HubSpot, a one second delay in website loading speed can reduce conversions by 7%. Now that's the bad news, but the good news is that increasing your website loading speed can also have the opposite effect. According to Mozilla Firefox, they were able to reduce their average website loading speed by 2.2 seconds, which increased their downloads by 15.4%. And when you think about it, that's a massive increase for a website like Firefox that gets a ton of traffic already. Now there are countless studies showing the importance of website loading speed and its effect not only on your organic search traffic performance, but also on your business's performance as well. But I'm not gonna bore you with more statistics. So if you want, you can go and search for all these different studies because there are probably hundreds at this point. But what I wanna do now is I wanna jump into the practical steps you can take to start increasing your website loading speed as soon as possible. So at the very minimum, you should aim to get your website loading speed to three seconds or below, and not to be Captain Obvious, but lower is better. And so the first thing you need to do to increase your website loading speed is to benchmark your current speed. And my favorite tool for benchmarking website loading speed is Pingdom. Here's how you use it. 
Simply go to tools.pingdom.com and enter your URL. And when I'm working on a new website, I'll run the site through Pingdom five to 10 times from different locations so I can get an average loading speed. This process will look a little bit like this. So as you can see here, I have five tests all from different locations, which all are showing different website loading speeds at that time in that location. And then what I do is I just go ahead and average them all out so I can get a general idea of what the average loading speed is for this particular website, because now this will act as a benchmark so that I know how I'm going to improve on that. And it's important to have benchmarks because it's gonna allow you to track your progress as well. So after you get your average website loading speed, you now need to start taking the steps to improve it. So the question is, where do you start? Well, there are countless resources online about how to improve your website loading speed, but there is one thing that is going to determine how fast your website actually loads. The one thing that's going to determine how quickly your website loads is your web hosting. Listen, you can make all kinds of micro changes to try to improve your website loading speed, but nothing is gonna have a bigger impact than your actual web host. And so I have tried hundreds of web hosts throughout the years, and the only one that I can truly recommend, and the one that I personally use, is WP Engine. So now you know the importance of a fast loading website, but now I wanna talk about the second big technical SEO action you need to take. The second high impact technical SEO action you need to take is to make sure that your website is mobile friendly. So I honestly sound like a broken record at this point, but it is so incredibly important that your website is mobile friendly because the majority of all traffic that is coming to your website at this point, more than likely is going to be coming from mobile. And there are some exceptions to the rule, such as my website, which is primarily B2B traffic. I'm gonna be getting a lot more desktop traffic, but it is not always going to be that way. And it is a safe action to take to make sure that your website is responsive and is friendly on a mobile device. But listen, I don't want you to just take my word for it because I wanna give you some real data about this trend that is going on with mobile traffic. According to Smart Insights, mobile digital media time in the US is now significantly higher at 51% compared to desktop at 42%. So now the question is, how do you go about actually making your website mobile friendly and responsive? Well, the first step is to see if your website is currently mobile friendly. And so the best way to accomplish this and to see if your website is currently mobile friendly is to use Google's own tool for checking mobile friendliness. So you can just open up Google and search mobile friendly test in Google, and you can use the embedded tool that they have in the search results, but I prefer using the actual tool that they have provided. And all you need to do is just enter your target URL, click run test to get started, and after the analysis is complete, Google will tell you whether or not your website is mobile friendly. So what do you do if your website is not mobile friendly? Well, there are a few options. The first option is if you have the capital to invest, you can reach out to web design and web development companies in your local area. So just a simple search like St. Louis web design company will give you lots of options to choose from. Or what you can do is you can create a job posting on Upwork and hire a freelance web designer, which is usually more affordable than hiring a company. You just have to be comfortable working with people outside of your country. For example, my web designers are located in Ukraine and my video editor is located in Russia. So you have to feel comfortable working with people all around the globe. And I can tell you from experience, they often tend to be some of the best workers that you will encounter in your business. But now let's say you don't have the budget to hire a company or a freelancer. Then the third and most affordable option is to do it yourself. So going about doing it yourself will depend on the content management system, also known as a CMS. But for example, if you're on WordPress, all you need to do is use a responsive theme. And there are both free and paid themes you can use if you wanna go this route. So now you know that your website needs to load very, very fast. Your website needs to be mobile friendly. And now I wanna explain the third and final high impact 
technical SEO action you need to take, which is to make sure that you develop an effective site architecture. So I'm not gonna get too deep into how to develop a site architecture because there are a ton of great resources out there and I could create an entire video just on that topic alone, but there are three primary objectives that you need to achieve when you are structuring your site architecture. So you need to find a fine balance between structuring your architecture for number one, user experience, which means how easy is it for users to go through your website and to flow through your website and is your website forcing them to think in any way? Because a good website will feel seamless and the user won't even have to think as they're trying to go through the website. The second thing you need to consider when structuring your architecture is how well it can be crawled by Google Spiders because you want Google to be able to crawl your website efficiently so that it can index all the pages on your website into the search engine. And the third and final objective that you need to achieve when structuring your architecture is building the actual authority through your architecture. Because if you develop a really great site architecture, you'll be able to spread precious backlink authority through your entire website and even to your most important pages so that your website will become more authoritative. And as your website becomes more authoritative, it becomes much easier to rank. So at this point, you understand the three high impact technical SEO and user experience optimization actions that you need to take. But now I wanna show you some of the micro technical issues that aren't gonna have a huge impact on your performance, but they're still very important to fix to make sure that you've built a very strong foundation for your SEO campaign. So the first micro technical issue you need to handle are broken links and 404 errors. So to find broken links, all you need to do is use a free tool like brokenlinkcheck.com. And once you're there, just enter your URL and click find broken links. And lastly, export all of the broken links that this tool finds to whatever type of SEO campaign sheet you're using so that you can then go through and start fixing all these broken links. And if you're using WordPress, there is a plugin you can install called Broken Link Checker which will perform the same function as brokenlinkcheck.com, except it's gonna just crawl your website and you're gonna be able to identify what those broken links are, probably at a higher rate than using brokenlinkcheck.com. So keep in mind that broken links and 404 errors do sometimes go hand in hand, but you should be auditing both of them separately because there are certain circumstances where you need to take different actions depending on what you have identified. So the process for when you find broken links is very straightforward. You just go through all of your broken links and you fix all those broken links and you make them not broken anymore. But when it comes to 404 errors, there is kind of a different approach and there is some strategy behind handling 404 errors that appear on your website. So in most cases, you just want to let a 404 page be a 404 because it is a signal to Google that you actually want that page to be removed from the index because it no longer exists. But there are some times where you do not want certain pages to continue to be 404s. And usually the one circumstance where you do not want a 404 to be pulled out of the index and to just be a 404 page is when that 404 page has backlinks. And when a 404 page has backlinks, you have two options. Number one, you can redirect that 404 page to a relevant page on your website, which should be your first option. And if there isn't a relevant page on your website, then you just wanna take that 404 page and redirect it to the homepage so that you can salvage that link equity. So at this point, how do you actually go about finding 404 errors? Well, there are many different ways to go about finding them, but my favorite way to find 404 errors is to use Google Search Console. So to find 404 errors in Google Search Console, simply go to the crawl section, click on crawl errors, and then click on the not found tab. And then lastly, go ahead and just export all of these 404 errors. And after you export these results, you'll wanna see if any of these pages have backlinks. So copy all of your URLs and then open up your favorite backlink analysis tool. For this example, I'll be using Ahrefs. So once you're inside Ahrefs, click on the more option in the navigation and then click on batch analysis. 
And then once you're in this section, go ahead and enter your URLs and click Start Analysis. Then all you have to do is just take note of the URLs that have backlinks and then decide where you're going to 301 redirect them on your website. And as I mentioned before, it is a good idea to try to find a relevant page on your website to redirect that 404 page before just sending it to the homepage. So the next micro-technical issue that you want to tackle are going to be redirects. So there are two types of redirects that cause problems. Number one, 302 redirects, and number two, redirect chains. Let me start with 302 redirects. So the main reason why you wanna fix 302 redirects is because of the small possibility that they do not pass link equity. The reason I'm saying the possibility is because of what John Mueller said back in 2016 about 302 redirects. Back in 2016, John Mueller said it's incorrect that 302 redirects wouldn't pass page rank. That's a myth. So now, although John Mueller is probably telling the truth, it's still a good idea to take the tried and tested approach, which is to use a 301 redirect because you know for sure that a 301 redirect is going to pass link equity and is going to pass page rank to the site that you are redirecting to. So then the question is, how do you find 302 redirects? In my experience, the absolute best way to find 302 redirects is to use Screaming Frog SEO Spider. So I'm inside Screaming Frog SEO Spider and all you need to do now to find 302 redirects is just enter your domain and then start the analysis. And then you're gonna click on the response codes tab and then click the filter and then select redirection. And then after that, just go ahead and export the results. So then all you need to do now, if you have 302 redirects, is you just need to go through the process of changing all of those 302 redirects to 301 redirects. And of course, the one exception to this rule is if you are using the 302 redirect for its actual purpose, which is as a temporary redirect. But in most cases, you're probably not gonna be using 302 redirects on purpose. So now I want to show you how to find redirect chains. And so the question is, what the heck is a redirect chain? So bear with me as I go through this explanation, but a redirect chain occurs when you have a redirect redirecting to a redirect. And the reason why this needs to be fixed is because you could be missing out on precious link equity as a result of the unnecessary redirect. So the way to fix this issue is to simply redirect the other page to the live page. That way, the link equity will now flow directly to the live page instead of through a buffer. So now, how do you actually go about finding redirect chains? Well, the best way to go about finding them is to use Screaming Frog SEO Spider once again. All right, so I'm back inside Screaming Frog SEO Spider, and all you need to do is enter your domain and start the analysis. And once the analysis is complete, click on Reports and then click on redirect chains, and then you have access to all of the redirect chains that your website currently has. So then all you have to do is just go through and start fixing all of these existing redirect chains that your website has so you can start recapturing that precious link equity directly to the page that is currently alive. So now that you understand how to find and fix redirects, I now want to show you the final two micro-technical issues that you need to tackle. And these two issues are most common with e-commerce websites. So if you have an e-commerce website, make sure you pay attention to this part. So the first issue is thin content. And at its most basic level, thin content is going to be any page that doesn't add much value to the user. And also keep in mind that thin doesn't necessarily mean short word counts. It can also mean that the pages are regurgitated content or the content doesn't actually bring anything new to the table. And that is why Google's Panda algorithm hates thin content. So with that said, these types of pages either need more content or need to be eliminated completely because they will drag your website down. And so here is how you can find thin content on your website. All you need to do is open Screaming Frog SEO Spider, enter your target domain, and start the analysis. Once the analysis is complete, stay on the internal tab and make sure the filter is set to all, 
and then click export. Now what you want to do is open up the CSV file, highlight the first row, and then place a filter on this row. Then scroll to the right until you find the word count column, and then you can delete all of the columns to the left of this column except for the address column. Then what you want to do is assort the word count column in ascending order so that the pages with the lowest word count are at the top. And now you're going to have access to all the pages on your site that have very low word counts and that may qualify as thin content that you'll need to take care of. And so the last micro technical issue that's very common with e-commerce websites is duplicate content. So duplicate content occurs when more than one page on your website has the same exact content. And this also applies to both content on the actual pages and your metadata as well. So the reason why you want to fix duplicate content is because it doesn't add value to your users. But more importantly, Google's Panda algorithm absolutely hates it. So with that said, this is how you can find duplicate content. So my personal favorite way to find duplicate content is to use SiteLiner. All you need to do is enter your URL and then let this tool work its magic. Once the analysis is complete, you'll see all the pages on your site that have duplicate content. And in my experience, the free version is more than enough to show you whether or not duplicate content is an issue on your particular website. All right, so now that you have a firm grasp on optimizing your site from a technical perspective and from a user experience perspective, it's time to jump into pillar two, which is the process of satisfying search intent. So the first stage of this process is to find keywords and build your keyword database. And so to achieve that goal, I'm going to show you three of my favorite methods for finding keywords and content ideas. So let me start with the first method, which is to use answer the public. All right, so I'm here on answer the public and all you need to do is enter a keyword phrase. And usually it's best to enter a broad phrase because then you're gonna get more long tail ideas out of that. So after you've entered your keyword, just click questions. And once the analysis is complete, just click download CSV and then add all of these ideas to your keyword master list. My second favorite method for finding great keyword and content ideas is to use relevant forums. So here's how you do it. All you need to do is open up Google and enter a simple search string such as fitness plus forum. Then just go into the first one that you find and take note of the categories because these are topics that you can expand on in the future to find new keyword ideas. So the next thing you wanna do is just go into a section and copy all of the ideas that have user engagement around them and then add them to your keyword master list. And lastly, my third favorite keyword research method is to use Quora. So here's how you do it. So go to Quora.com and enter a topic into the search bar on the right-hand side. And then simply go into the topic and copy all of the ideas you find that have a lot of user engagement around them. So now that you know a few ways that you can find keywords and content ideas, you now have to go through the process of actually qualifying those ideas and then prioritizing your keyword list because you're not gonna be able to go after every single keyword that you found. So you need to have a process in place to be able to filter through all these keywords that you found and then most importantly, be able to prioritize them so you can actually start taking the steps to target those specific keywords. So the truth is that most people use search volume from the Google Keyword Planner as their guiding light to determine what keywords they want to go after. And this is totally fine. And this is the most common practice, but I want to take it up another notch. And I want to show you five different ways you can qualify your keywords and content ideas so you can practically guarantee the success of any page that you're going to create around the keywords that you choose. So here are the five qualifiers you should be using to prioritize your keyword list. So as I mentioned, the first and most commonly used keyword qualifier is search volume. So what you need to do to find search volume is just go into the Google Keyword Planner and enter your keyword. And then the Google Keyword Planner is going to show you exactly how much search volume this specific keyword phrase gets and also how much search volume other related keywords get as well. 
So as I mentioned, I do believe you should use search volume as your primary qualifier for what keywords you're gonna go after, but you should also use these other methods I'm gonna show you to really get a clear understanding of what's possible for that particular keyword phrase. So let me show you those now. So my second favorite qualifier is to use user signals. So basically any place where there are communities and where users engage on the platform through the process of commenting on things, liking things, upvoting things, et cetera, these are all signals that people in your industry are interested in a particular topic. And this is extremely valuable because you're getting validation that the keyword or content idea that you're gonna go after is actually interesting and that people in your industry are actually interested in it. And that's really important before you put all this effort into creating a really great page. You wanna make sure that people actually care about the idea. So using user signals is a great way to feel confident in taking those actions to create a really great page. And then the third keyword qualifier that I love to use is how well the idea is trending at this particular time. So to find this information, go to Google Trends and throw your keyword in there. Now keep in mind, your idea doesn't need parabolic trend growth, but it should be concerning if it's declining because it may be an idea that isn't evergreen. And you should be focusing a lot of your effort on keywords and content ideas that are evergreen because you wanna to continue to grow your traffic over time as opposed to getting a huge spike of traffic and then it just slowly decreasing over time. Those are topics you don't really wanna focus on unless you have a news-based website or a non-evergreen based website. And now the fourth keyword qualifier is to see how well the idea has performed on social media. So to find this information, I recommend using BuzzSumo. So just go to buzzsumo.com and enter your idea. Then BuzzSumo will show you all the social shares your idea has generated. And this is important because if your idea has gotten a lot of social traction, that is a good sign. That's a great qualifier. That this is a good idea to actually go after because people are sharing it. People are interested in it. And those are all great signals. And the final keyword qualifier that you need to consider is how link worthy the topic actually is. So in other words, are websites in your niche willing to link to pages about this particular topic? So all you need to do to find the link worthiness of a topic is to use any popular link analysis tools such as Ahrefs, Majestic, or even Open Site Explorer. So in this case, I'm just gonna use Ahrefs. So all you need to do is just go to the SERPs for your target keyword and then export the top 10, and then just open up Ahrefs and then go to the batch analysis tool and then put those URLs into the batch analysis. And then from there, if these results have backlinks, then you know that this topic is link worthy. So now the question is, does a keyword need to meet all of this criteria for you to actually go after it? And of course the answer is no, but if you find keyword ideas that do meet all of these standards and do meet these criteria, you can pretty much guarantee the success of that content given you create a page in the way that I'm about to show you. But with that said, this process of qualifying your keywords and content ideas is so that you're not guessing about what topics your audience actually cares about. And instead, you're using real data and you're using real signals to determine what topics you should be going after based on real signals. And that's really, really important because you don't wanna be guessing what types of pages you should be creating. You should just be following exactly what your users are showing you in your industry. So now that you have a nice list of qualified keywords, what you need to do now is you need to develop your search intent strategy. And you've probably heard me say this before, but satisfying search intent is the most critical step of this process. And you might be wondering why. Well, the reason why is because if you don't satisfy search intent, there is a very high probability that you will not rank. Well, the good news is that it is very easy to satisfy search intent correctly. All that you have to do is just model your competitors who are ranking on the first page for your target keyword. So let's say your target keyword is SEO audit tool. So if you look at the results for this keyword phrase, SEO audit tool, you'll notice that the majority of the results are actually SEO audit tools. 
And so that means that if you wanted to rank for that particular keyword phrase, you would need to create your own SEO audit tool. And that is literally all it takes to satisfy search intent. Just look at the first page and model what is currently ranking. If all of the results are tools, then you know you need to create a tool and you don't need to create a 3,000 word article. And this is a very, very important point because a lot of people think that every single keyword targeted page that you wanna rank in Google needs to have 1,800 words or 2,000 words, but this is just simply not true. All that matters is how you're going to satisfy search intent. And if the intent is someone is just looking for a tool, then you just give them the tool. They don't wanna read an article about the tool, they want the tool. And so understanding how searchers think when they're conducting these search queries is so critical to your success in SEO. And so the more you study it, the more you'll get better at it. But the best way to go about it is just model what is currently ranking. So now it's time for me to talk about the big action piece of this pillar, which is the process of actually creating a keyword targeted page. So I'm not gonna get super deep into the process of creating keyword targeted pages because first of all, I have an entire course, Content Academy, that is dedicated to creating SEO content because it is such an intense process. But I'm going to share two very important things you need to understand when it comes to creating effective keyword targeted content. So the first thing you need to understand if you wanna create great and effective keyword targeted pages is that your page or blog post or whatever page you're using to target that keyword it needs to be different than what is currently ranking. And then number two, it needs to also be 10x more valuable than what is currently ranking as well. So in my opinion, most of your efforts should be focused on how you're going to differentiate your page against the pages that are currently ranking because it's much easier to be different than it is to try to be more valuable in my honest opinion. So I'm gonna be dedicating a lot of time into teaching you how to differentiate your keyword targeted pages from your competitors in future videos. But for now, I'm gonna show you a few methods you can use to really make these pages stand out. So the first way to differentiate your keyword targeted pages is to challenge industry norms. So this is generally going to apply to blog posts, but challenging industry norms is a very effective way to attract attention to your keyword targeted pages. So then all you need to do is just make a list of all of the industry norms or common practices within your industry and then figure out how you're going to disrupt those ideas or figure out how those ideas are wrong, essentially. And this point actually brings me to differentiation technique number two, which is to establish a unique perspective or gather unique data. So the good news is that having a unique perspective is very easy because no one else has walked a day in your shoes and so you automatically have a unique perspective and therefore you can make your content unique just from that perspective alone. But if you wanna make your content even deeper and you wanna add levels to it, one of the best things that you can do is create your own unique data or research. And so this is a very, very powerful technique and it really can act as a great form of link bait when you create your own unique data. So my third and final differentiation technique is to tell relevant stories. So stories are extremely powerful and we use them to make sense of the world. The good news is that storytelling is nothing more than a skill that you can develop. So what I recommend you doing is to start to build your story archive so that you can pull relevant stories whenever you need to and you can inject those into your content. And you've probably noticed throughout this video that I've dropped several different stories. And the reason for this is to, first of all, keep you engaged in the content, but most importantly, it's to help solidify the concepts that I'm explaining at a deeper level because it's easier to relate with a story than it is for me to just throw information at you. So the main takeaway is that you need to start using stories and the good news is that it's very easy because no one else has your stories. So these are just a few of the methods I personally use to differentiate all of my keyword targeted content but if you really wanna learn how to create effective keyword targeted content, 
one of the best things to do is analyze keyword targeted content that has already performed well. So below this video, I'm gonna give you access to 21 examples of perfect SEO content. And this is a swipe file that you can download 100% free. And it's just gonna show you 21 real pieces of keyword targeted content and pieces of link bait that have performed exceptionally well. So like I said, the link will be below the video and it is 100% free. So at this point, all that is left is for you to start strategizing and brainstorming how you're gonna actually create your keyword targeted content. Now, unfortunately, this is as far as I can go because at this point, you just have to actually create the content or outsource the creation of the content or give it to a team member to create. But no matter which path you're taking, the content has to be created. Because listen, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how much information I give you, how much guidance I give you, all that matters is that you take the information I give you and you take action on it. Because if you don't take action on it, none of the information is going to work. But you taking action is what will determine your success. And most importantly, when you take action, you solidify the concepts that you learn so much faster. And when you have real experiences, that is the best way to learn. So now the question is, what do you do after you've created a perfect keyword targeted page? Well, you have to promote it and you have to build backlinks to that page if you really want it to succeed. Because at the end of the day, almost every single page you're going to create is going to need backlinks to be able to reach the first page. And of course, there are exceptions to the rule. For example, if you have a super authoritative website, you're not gonna need a ton of backlinks to rank. But for most of us, we're going to need to acquire new backlinks to any new keyword targeted page that we create in order for it to reach the first page in most cases. So you may or may not know this, but I created a massive guide on how to build backlinks. And all that you need to do is just follow this guide and you'll learn everything you need to know about building backlinks to your website. And I'll have a link below this video so that you can go and check that out. And because I've already created this massive guide that actually ranks on the first page for the keyword backlinks, which is pretty awesome, I'm not gonna show you how to build backlinks in this particular video, but I am gonna give you six link building tips that you should follow. So the first link building tip is that relevancy is king. So the majority of your backlinks should be coming from websites that are relevant to yours. And this is the most important element of link building. You should only be focusing on prospects that are closely relevant to your business. And it's a good idea to focus on the most relevant opportunities first, and then work your way down to the less relevant opportunities. And this is actually what I like to call the relevancy pyramid, where you start at the absolute most relevant opportunities, which is a small percentage and is the top of the pyramid. But as you go down the pyramid, though you're gonna have more opportunities, but they're going to be less relevant. And so I'll have a link below the video about the relevancy pyramid. But like I said, focus all of your effort on acquiring the most relevant links possible. So the second tip is that authority is queen. So if relevancy is king, then authority is king. So the ideal situation is that you find a website that is 100% relevant to yours and also has a lot of authority. And if you can find both of these factors, you're gonna get a lot of link power going to your website. The third link building tip is that creating content assets and creating linkable content assets is the most scalable link building strategy there is. Because at the end of the day, it is much easier to promote a really valuable piece of content than it is to promote a product page or a category page or even a home page. Because people are much more willing to link to a page that adds a ton of value in your industry as opposed to any of those other pages. The fourth tip is that contextual links are best. So in general, you should try to get backlinks that are in the actual meat of the content. And the way you do that is usually through getting links naturally, but you can use some other methods to get those links higher up. Because when you land something like a guest post, for example, you're gonna get a link in the author bio, which can be somewhat effective for sending link authority to your website, but nothing is more effective than getting a link in the actual body of a piece of content on another relevant website. So the fifth tip is that anchor text matters. So in addition to my huge guide on how to build backlinks, I actually have a guide and a video 
on how to optimize your anchor text. And so I'll have a link below this video for you to check that out. But understanding how to optimize anchor text is so incredibly important to your success with your link building efforts. And my sixth and final link building tip is that you need to prioritize relationships over backlinks. So why do I say you should prioritize building relationships over backlinks? Well, it's quite simple because you want to focus all of your effort and all of your time, especially when you're new to an industry, in building relationships with the key influencers in your industry. More importantly, the people that have established audiences in your industry. And the reason for this is quite obvious because you wanna be able to pull some of that audience from them and build your brand that way as well. But the only way for that to be possible is you have to add value to these people who have established audiences. And if you do it the right way and you take your time, this is gonna lead to backlinks down the road, this is gonna lead to social shares, and most importantly, this is gonna lead to, to real relationships that can actually benefit not only your business, but benefit their business as well. So those are the six tips you need to know for building backlinks effectively. And if you really wanna learn how to build backlinks from point A to Z, make sure you check out my guide below this video. All right, I can't believe it, but we are finally to the fourth and final pillar of my SEO strategy, which is to optimize and amplify. So the first stage of this pillar is on the conversion level. And the reason why is because what a lot of people don't realize is that when you start getting organic search visitors, the majority of those people that land on your site will never come back to your website again. And that is why it's absolutely fundamental that you have the ability to remarket to these people that land on your website. So how do you go about doing that? Well, there are two ways to accomplish this goal. So the first way to accomplish this goal is to start building retargeting lists. And these can be on Facebook, this can be on Google AdWords, this can be on YouTube, and this can also be on Twitter, et cetera. And just to be clear, this doesn't mean that you're gonna start advertising to these individuals, but it's just a good idea to have these retargeting lists built on Facebook, on Google AdWords, and any other ad platform, because these are assets for your business. And the reason why is because even if these searchers or anyone who lands on your site doesn't become a customer or doesn't subscribe to your email list or doesn't convert in any way on your website, you will still have the ability to advertise and remarket to these individuals on these other platforms. And this is incredibly powerful for your business. The second conversion tactic that you should be using is to start trying to get some of these searchers and website visitors onto an email list. So there have been countless marketing channels and mediums that have come and gone all throughout history, but the one that has stood the test of time is email, and it still continues to be one of the best channels for nurturing your prospects, and most importantly, being able to market to those prospects. And in my experience, there is no better way to get people on your email list than using lead magnets. So an example of a lead magnet is the swipe file you're going to download below the video, which is called 21 Examples of Perfect SEO Content. And the reason why lead magnets work so well is because it is an exchange of value. So the way it works is that you're getting value because of the information that I'm giving you, and then my business is getting value because you have freely given me your email in exchange for that value. And when you give me your email, that gives me the ability to continue building a relationship with you. So those are the two primary conversion tactics you must be using. And now at this point, I wanna show you one of my absolute favorite amplification methods for growing your organic search traffic without having to create any new content and without having to acquire any new backlinks. This method is called the authority transfer technique. And you can use the authority transfer technique whenever you publish a new blog post. So here's how it works. Number one, you publish your new blog post. Number two, you identify relevant pages on your website that have existing backlinks. And then number three, you place internal links on the relevant pages that will link to your new blog posts. So why is this effective? So the reason why the authority transfer technique is so effective is because you're giving your new content asset a boost 
right out of the gate. And it's crazy because sometimes this method is enough to get you to the top of the second page and even sometimes to the first page without getting any backlinks at all. And this technique just shows you the power of understanding how to distribute link equity on your website. So if you like the authority transfer technique, then you're going to love the other two amplification methods that I share in my free download below this video called SEO Cheat Codes. So that is all for this SEO strategy. So if you got a lot of value from this video, please give it a big thumbs up and please subscribe to my channel if you want more SEO and marketing videos just like this one. And also, if you have any questions at all or you just have some thoughts you wanna share with me, please leave it below in the comment section because I respond to every single one. So I just wanna thank you so much for watching this video and for spending your time with me today. And I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Thank you so much.